quite an adventure watching and getting to know some of these little cats that run around our church. Not actual cats. We don't have cats in our church. But getting to know some of these kids in our church, because I'm going to tell you something. You may think you may think that you have it or had it hard. And you may have. And my soul breaks for you. But there are kids in our community that need the love of Jesus in their life. And they're watching us. They're watching us. They watch how we talk to each other. They watch how we talk about each other. Kids are way smart, man. Way smart. And if we are the ones that say we have the light, and kids walk past the hallway, and they hear people talking about someone else in the church or someone or the pastor, it does not show the kid very much love. What we're going to do this week is we're going to take a journey on what, um, on what we did. I just said that because that was something I had to get off my chest. I had a kid come up to me and tell me that another leader had a certain thought about who, who I was, thought, thought, thought that I wasn't, um, I didn't treat something the right way. And this kid didn't even go to our church. And he was just walking through the fellowship hall, and he had heard somebody say something and brought it to my attention. And I'm just letting you know, church, as long as we conduct ourselves in a way where people see and hear us tear into each other, they will not know us by our love. They will not know us by our love. So that's out of the way. Here's the deal. Last week, the kids walked every night. They walked through a journey. And it was a beautiful journey, man. It was a beautiful journey because it was a journey where the kids could relate to it. I know little Noah. And I know little me. When me and Noah, I, I call you little. I mean, I know you can school me on a basketball field. But when I looked at Noah about Thursday night, I could see it in his eyes. It was clicking. So let me show you what they let me show you what they went through. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this challenge to the fathers in the room. And I'm going to give these challenge to the remaining people in the room. Because if we can grab a hold of what kids grabbed a hold of last week, it would radically change our life. The central theme of last week when we went through VBS was that life is wild, but God is good. Missy, life is wild, but God is good. You can attest to that, can't you? Marion, life is wild, but God is good, right? That's right. Taggart family, life is wild, but God is good, right? That's it. Now, see, this sounds simple, but it's radical when we apply it to our life. Because, see, when I get on the wild ride of life, and I go the ups and downs, whether it's financial, physical, sickness, whatever it is, changes, whatever. I have a tendency to think that I'm a little better than I really am and God is not as good as He is. And when we take the truth of God's Word and we hide it in our heart, when those times come, which they will come, doubt will always come because the enemy is not bound yet. But when that doubt comes that God may not be good, then the truth of God's Word screams out, yes, God is good. And that radically changed how you see your circumstances. And so they went over five truths last week. And, and, and what I'm going to do now is since you know where we're speaking from, I'm going to break away speaking from BBS. And I now want to speak to you. Is that okay? Can we do that? All right, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm, or I'm sorry, Nahum 1-7. Nahum, everybody say, Nahum. All right. Thank you for those that did that. It was good for my soul. Nahum chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse 7. Those of y'all that are in our Habakkuk study know that this is the book right behind Habakkuk. This is the book that's right before Habakkuk. This is the book where God pronounces his judgment on the Assyrians. The same Assyrians that were coming in at the people of Israel and Habakkuk. Man, I want to talk about Habakkuk so much. Nahum 1.7. If you got your place and your body is able and you're willing, will you stand in the honor of reading God's word? <clears throat> the Lord is good. 
a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. God, sanctify us by your truth. Change us, Lord, by your truth. And your word is truth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. The first point I want to tell you today in having a proper identity of who God is. Because we learned, didn't we, Noah? Didn't we, Evelyn? We learned God was good last week. So the best way that we know that how we can know God, who God is, is when life is unfair, God is good. When life is unfair, God is good. Now, that sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? Because we're all grown-ups. We all have the right perspective on life. And we all know that things happen the right way and everything's fair in this world, right? Or the rich get rich and the poor get poor. Or what is it? I don't know. All I know is in my life, I've had some unfair moments where I've thought, God, this stinks. It's not fair. I don't like it. And I'm questioning your goodness. Your goodness is what's on the table, God. And if I can't say you're good, how am I going to give my life to you? So what we learned in Nahum 1, 7, we learned that the Lord is good. So we start with the wrong premise. We don't start that, okay, I'm going to interpret my environment and then go to the truth of God. No, we start with the truth of God, which is the Lord is good. God is good. We take that truth and we engage our environment with that truth. Does that make sense? We don't, we don't run out and experience the world and then turn around to ask God who He is. We know who God is, and then we go out into the world. Make sense? This right here tells us the Lord is good. Now, He is also a strong refuge. Any of you guys, did any of you guys follow the, um, the, the stories in, um, in Syria when things broke out about probably three and a half years ago? They, they started having... They started having the first reports of, of, of Syrian refugees crossing the border into Turkey and Syrian refugees that were getting in boats. And, 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 it, and it kept happening. Two years ago, it, it probably peaked. Probably a year and a half ago, it peaked. But you know what a refugee is? Somebody who's had everything taken from them and they have no place to go. Quite unfair. Quite unfair. So you know what God says? You don't have a place to go, I'll be your refuge. You don't have a place to hide, I'll be your refuge. You come hide in my truth. You come hide with my people. You come hide in my house, I will be your refuge. Why? Because I am the Lord and I am good and I am capable of protecting you. And he says right there in the verse, he says a strong refuge when trouble comes. When life is unfair, God is good. Secondly, when life is scary, God is good. When life is scary, God is good. Turn in your scriptures with me or follow on the screen. Psalm 23, 4. I can't tell you how many funerals I've read this at. Places and times and moments in people's lives where they have looked with so much fear, knowing that this wasn't fair, and I've had to look and say to them, even though you or I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is the truth of God that we have to grab a hold of because when life gets scary, God is good. I remember I, I remember I remember when Cody and I um, when she met me um, I was not in a good place I was not in a good place matter of fact I was in the opposite of a good place and she was the one that kept me um, going she would make sure see what had happened it's pretty crazy how God works what happened was my body had 
somehow uh, come up with this allergic reaction to methamphetamines. God has done this three occasions in my life where I've been in sin and he has physically made it impossible for me to do it. And you know what I did? I said, no, I don't care. I'll just eat fistfuls of Benadryl to counter the reaction and I'll still do my math. And I was on this cycle, man, of just horrible place. I was seeing ghosts. I was talking to people that weren't there. I was, I was saying things that wouldn't make sense. I, 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 had, I wasn't eating. I wasn't drinking. I, didn't, I looked like death. And here comes this little woman who came to my house who all of her friends said, stay away from him. He's nothing but trouble. He's going to do nothing but ruin you. And she came, and she would come, and she would sit by me because I would be so scared. I would see my mom sitting on the couch and she would look at me and I would talk to her and cry to her and, and, and I would say, just speak to me, mom, just talk to me. And I would go and I would run my hand and it would go right through her and it would dissipate. And then I realized that I'm hallucinating. And not only that, but the enemy is sitting up there laughing at me, man. Laughing at me, saying, look at him. And I was scared. And my wife would come, not my wife, or my friend then, she would come and she would sit and she would hold my hand and she would get me a glass of water and she would make sure I drank and she would make sure that when she saw I was getting overheated that she'd put a fan on me. She'd take me to the hospital when things got too serious. But she was God's physical representation of his presence in my life. She was good, and she was a place of refuge, and she was strong, and, and I knew that God was guiding me because this woman was keeping me alive against, against the thoughts of everyone else around her. But you know what God told her? God said, I've got a plan. God, and I'm not saying this. You know how bad I am. God told Cody, I've got a plan for Blake. And I want you to be with him. See, she surrendered to ministry when she was, um, I don't know, probably, Bailey, how old are you? All right, so I think she was 19. She's about a year younger than you. She surrendered to ministry, missions, actually. That was what she wanted to do. Bailey's about to go on a mission trip. And, and she surrendered to missions, and she had no idea what that meant. And she was so frustrated with God because it didn't play out how she wanted it to play out. You know, she was going to go down to Honduras with nothing but a Walmart sack and sandals, right? That was what she was going to do. But little did she know that she, God was going to take her and put her on mission at 615 and a half Dakota Avenue in Chickasha with a doped up kid who was lost. And then she loved me to Jesus. She loved me to Jesus. That's what she did. And what I'm telling you guys is the only reason that occurred in my life is because God is good. Um, when life uh, is scary, God is good. We know that when life is unfair, God is good. If you look at Psalm 106 verse 1, this is very, very key right here. Psalm 106 verse 1. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Now, why in the world do we need steadfast love? Because when life changes, God is good. When life changes, God is good. We've got kids in our community that do not know where they're going to sleep until they get there. We got kids in the community that live in different families with different people and different homes and different towns with different faces, different names, different friend sets, different school sets. It ain't nothing but change after change after change after change after change. And we need to live a life that shows them that when life changes, God is good. When life changes, God is good. Dads, we can tell that to our kids. But if they don't see us live a life, it shows how good God is even when life is changing. 
that ain't going to mean in a legal sense. Next, I want to point you. I want to point you to Psalm thirty-four, sixteen. Psalm thirty-four, sixteen is a very, um, um, very amazing verse. Um, it, 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 it says Psalm thirty-four, uh, eighteen. I'm sorry, not sixteen, eighteen. I apologize. Psalm thirty-four, eighteen says, "The Lord is close to the brokenhearted." The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Man, what does Matthew 5, 3 say? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are brokenhearted, who know that they have nothing to offer. Okay, but then what about those people who are brokenhearted because life broke them? What about the people who are brokenhearted because dad left or mom left or they lost their kids or something happened or any reason in the world, fill in the blank, all of that stuff. What about those people? Well, let me tell you something. God is good. He is good when life changes. He is good when life is scary. He is good. When life is unfair, he's good. Um, another, um, I'll close with this. On uh, Nehemiah 4.14, um, you guys know the story of Nehemiah. Uh, you know that uh, Nehemiah is um, somebody that was the king's the wine cup taster or the cup taster for the king, the, the guy who would taste the food in case the king got poisoned, but he was captive. He wasn't free, right? He was taken captive. And he's chilling there in the king's quarter one day, and somebody comes in and updates Nehemiah. Man, I just went through the area of Jerusalem, and it's in ruins. It's still in ruins. The walls are still crumbled. And Nehemiah gets a burden. He goes to the king, and the king gives him. Isn't it crazy how when God calls us to do something and we don't even know how we're going to get it done, that what we need to do, it just seems to come out of nowhere? That's nuts. Well, it must be because God is good. Look what happens here in, in this verse in particular, Nehemiah 4, 14. He is speaking to the people, and he says, Remember to the Lord who is great and glorious. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and is awesome and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives. Nehemiah had the task of convincing a group of people that God was good enough that they could leave down their defenses to a point and apply their force and energy to rebuild the walls. And there had to be trust. And see, that trust only came when Nehemiah was able to give them the word. And if you're familiar with the story, Nehemiah does that constantly when he's with the people. He gives them the truth of God's word. And he says, remember, there at the end of that verse, remember to the Lord who is great and glorious. The last thing that I want to say today is that when life is good, God is good. When life's good, God's good. See, sometimes we don't stop and just praise Him, man. Right? Because He's been so good to us. Matter of fact, the only time we talk to Him is when things are falling apart. But oh, when life is good, that moment of worship happens when you can raise your hands to the Father and say, God, my life right now I know it'll change, but right now it is good. And that's because you are good. God, I know, I know the situation with me and this person or me and this group of people or me and this is unfair. I know, God, it's unfair. But so were the Israelite slaves. When, and so were they, so was it unfair when Moses went to them and he went to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh got mad and he made them do twice the amount of work. Twice as many bricks. And the Hebrew, the Israelites were like, what's going on, Moses? 
You're supposed to free us, and now we're having to do twice the labor. It's not fair. God's good. And then life changed for them, didn't it, man? They left. They left. It, no, matter of fact, it got scary because the Pharaoh wouldn't let it go. So what happened? Plagues came. Plagues came. And, and those of y'all that were here when the flood came here, I, I, was, I wasn't around, but Adonna Bridges spent a lot of time talking to me about that season of time here in this community. Anytime a natural disaster of any kind comes through or anything like a plague happens, then you understand that it's very easy to be scared and not know what's going to happen. Just like the Israelites were when they didn't understand what was happening. But they knew he was good. And then they left. They went into the desert. And life changed seriously for him, man. Seriously. Matter of fact, they told Moses, even in Egypt when we were slaves, we had food to eat and huts to live in. Now we're out here, no water, no food, nothing. Everything's changed, Moses. Everything's changed, and it stinks. What God do? He told Moses. He told Moses, I want you to do this. And when you do this, this water that is bitter, it's going to become sweet. And you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to let things fall from heaven to feed their bellies. And they had to learn that when life was scary and when life changed, that God was good. And then you fast forward all the way all the way to when they finally had gotten to the promised land and they saw that the Lord was good. And even from that point to now when we read the Old Testament, we see that it was a process of people learning these things, wasn't it? It was a process of people learning. That's what I try to tell my son, man. It's like, Creed, it's going to be a process. You're going to screw up. It's part of the process. I was telling someone I'm discipling the other day, my first year I relapsed 10 times. 10 times I relapsed. It took me 10 times to go face to face with my sin and say, okay, God, I get it. It don't fit. It's not good. It was a process for me to come to the realization to know that the Lord is good, that God is good. And then... And then I think about the story where Jesus is, is chilling with his disciples the last night. And John chapter 13, 14, 15, or 15, he's out of the upper room. But he's chilling there with his disciples and he's telling them, man, you know, there's somebody in this room that's going to betray me. And the disciples were freaking out. They're like, who is it, right? And then God, through his sovereignty, through the form of his son, gets to a point in the evening where Jesus stands up and he tells Judas, go do what your father Satan has put in your heart to do. And Judas stands up and leaves, and you can imagine the surprise. Everybody's freaking out. What is going on? We trusted this guy. Not only that, but he handled our money. He walked with us three years. How can he be the one to turn us over? And he left. And they're sad. And then Jesus says this. I am going to have to leave. Don't, don't fear. Don't be brokenhearted. Because if I go, I can send another. And he will allow you to do things even greater than I can. And what was crazy is that in that moment, those disciples loved Jesus. They loved him. And they were sad. And Jesus gently reminded them, when life is sad, guys, remember that God is good. God is good. And then we get to the day when he rises from the tomb. Three days later, man. And guess what? Life was good. And guess what? So was God. Fathers, Let's live a life that promotes the goodness of God. Let's live a life that promotes the goodness of God. Because, see, that is what people struggle with the most, is the goodness of God. How can God be good if? So let's promote a life that shows that even though life is scary, 
even though life is unfair, even though life changes, God is good. And especially when life is good, God is good. Amen. Amen. As our, as our invitation team comes forward, let me pray over us. Heavenly Father, I just, um, I don't know, God, I, I had a sermon plan, Father, that you we were supposed to talk about the purposes of your grace today. And I feel like, God, that you wanted us to look at this because it's so important uh, for me, for my walk, Lord. When I'm scared or when my life changes or when things don't seem right or when things are shaky, God, that I've got to know that regardless, you are good. And if I anchor myself to you, God, and if these people will anchor themselves to you, and if these children will anchor themselves to you, if they will take refuge and the refuge, we can survive anything. So, Father, please, I know your Holy Spirit is searching the room right now for those who do not know you. God, you know, you know those in this room right now that if they died, they would spend eternity separated from you, regardless of how religious they look, God, regardless of how clean or dirty in appearance is, God. I can look good all day long, but only you are good, Father. And so if there be anyone in this room that do not know you as Lord and Savior, may today be the day that you call them to salvation. And for someone in this room, God, who just who just has forgotten that truth, that you are good. And they feel the pain of what it is to forget about what it is about God that's true. And they just needed to be reminded, God, that I pray, Lord, you would move in their heart. Either way, Father, whatever people need to do business with you today, I pray they do business. We love you, and it's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Lord David.